Prophetic visionaries, the Oracle of Delphi, Joseph, son of Jacob, Nostradamus, were they shrewd imposters or gifted prophets? Explore the timeless human urge to see into the unknown. In our own time, mankind has sent probes deep into outer space and unlocked the secrets of the atomic world. Yet one frontier remains an enigma, the challenge of knowing the future. And yet, since ancient times, a handful of prophets, seers, and oracles have believed they could see beyond the barrier of time. Is the future discernible for some, or perhaps even for all of us? Thousands of people have experiences that are precognitive, you know, ordinary folks, nothing special about them. It may happen once in their life, twice, and that's all. On the other hand, there are clearly individuals who seem to have better My own personal view is that precognition and premonitions are completely baseless, that this in fact doesn't happen, that we live in a world where the future is not predetermined in any important way. It is a phenomenon known by many names, premonition, precognition, and prophecy. All share one fundamental meaning, the ability to foretell the future. From tribal priests in Africa to shamans in the Americas, every culture has fostered its prophets. Is it possible that some possess the ability to foresee coming events? In Babylonia 5,000 years ago, kings employed astrologers to help them make crucial decisions of state. In Central America, the ancient Maya are said to have predicted the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors more than six centuries before their ships loomed on the horizon. In Tibet, many believe that Buddhist holy men foretold the invasion of the British army a hundred years before it took place. Were these true predictions of the future or nothing more than coincidence? In ancient Greece, those driven to know their future would set forth on an arduous pilgrimage that took them 70 miles from Athens. There they would climb the forbidding slopes of Mount Parnassus to reach the lofty site where it was said the gods deigned to speak to man. This was the mysterious sanctuary of the Oracle of Delphi. Once inside the sanctuary, a believer would wind along a path called the Sacred Way, past solemn statues and hallowed stones, until he reached the temple itself. There, a priest would lead his visitor into the gloomy depths, the inner sanctum of the temple. Seated over a fissure in the ground was a lone woman known as the Oracle, the seer of the future. She inhaled the strange vapors issuing from the fissure, and in a trance-like state, spoke the words of the gods. At the crucial moment, the believer would pose his question to the oracle, also known as a Pythia. Her reaction remains one of the most tantalizing riddles of the ancient world. I think if I could know anything about the Delphic Oracle, I would want to know exactly what happened when the client asked the Pythia the question. That is, I'd like to know where she was sitting. I'd like to know her facial features. I'd like to know if her voice changed. I would like to know how the clients looked at her and received her answer. That's what I would like to know. All that is known is that the faithful visitor would receive his answer, a prediction said to reveal his future.
ancient chronicles maintain that the prophecies of the oracles were astonishingly accurate. They are said to have foretold the genius of the poet Homer, creator of the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Pythias are also credited with predicting the death of the Roman emperor Nero. I think that the Pythias believed that they were pronouncing the future. And I think that the clients who received those answers believed that they contained the future. I see no reason not to believe it. Over more than 10 centuries, scores of seers assumed the title of the Oracle of Delphi. It was a position occupied only by women. But were these legendary women truly psychic? The Delphic Oracle, it looked like they were in some altered state, like channelers do today. Whether they were speaking with the voice of the gods or speaking from an internal process of psychic information, that's a big question, but the information often came out correctly. Most scholars, however, discount the reputation of the oracles. Those prophecies tended to be very, very vague. So pretty much no matter what happened, the oracle got credit for being correct. It's a you know, kind of heads I win, tails you lose situation in many of these prophecies. Whether the oracles truly possessed a sixth sense remains debatable. What is known is that for centuries, some of the most powerful rulers of the ancient world made the pilgrimage to Mount Parnassus to consult the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle of Delphi was by no means the only prophet of the ancient world. According to the Bible, in the age of the pharaohs, one visionary foretold the future through dreams. Ancient Israel, land of the Bible. In a holy place renowned for its prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the ancient practice of foretelling the future was branded pagan sorcery. For the role of the Hebrew prophets was not to predict the future but to induce the people of Israel to adhere to their holy covenant with God. Nevertheless, the Hebrew Bible contains many accounts of seers. One of the most famous biblical predictions comes not from a prophet, but from the son of the Hebrew patriarch Jacob, an ordinary man named Joseph. Ordinary, that is, in all ways but one, he used dreams to foretell the future, because in Joseph's world, dreams offered a magical window into the unknown. Four thousand years ago in ancient Egypt, dreams were viewed as terrifying enigmas. The Egyptians considered them ominous messages from the gods. So the ancient Egyptians believed that every dream was prophetic. What you really need was someone who could interpret it. According to the Bible, Joseph was gifted with the ability to accurately interpret dreams. As a boy, his dreams foretold that he would rise to a position of awesome power. As a man imprisoned in Egypt, he prophesied the fate of others, interpreting their dreams. Then one fateful day, Joseph was called before the Pharaoh. The Egyptian ruler revealed that he was deeply troubled by a dream, one that not even his wisest priests could decipher. In the Pharaoh's dream, seven emaciated cows consume seven portly cows, but get no fatter. Then seven full ears of corn are devoured by seven withered ears. Joseph's insightful response is one of the best-known prophecies of the Hebrew Bible. 
God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout the land of Egypt. But after then, there will arise seven years of famine, and the famine will consume the land. Genesis 41, 28. Joseph advised the Pharaoh that grain be stored during the prosperous years to provide enough to last through the lean years to come. Putting his faith in Joseph, Pharaoh placed him in charge of the national granaries. Through Joseph's foresight, the land of Egypt was spared a terrible famine, and Joseph reaped the reward of his vision as a trusted counselor from then on. The Bible only hints at the source of Joseph's gift, suggesting that he may have inherited his extraordinary powers from his father, Jacob. Joseph is someone who understands people's visions and people's dreams. Um, I, why exactly that plays out, I don't know, except I will say that it's a family tradition. Jacob, after all, also had dreams. Despite the biblical account, most scholars dismiss the interpretation that Joseph could see the future. What has come down to us has been filtered through chroniclers and writers and translators. Uh, so it's essentially at this point, I think, impossible to know whether those were valid prophecies or not. I suspect very strongly, of course, that they weren't. The controversy over Joseph's powers as described in the Bible may never be resolved. Whatever his prophetic ability, the Bible leaves no doubt that Joseph helped the nation avert certain disaster. Another prophet of ancient times, however, delivered a much more ominous prediction for all mankind. This prophecy of doom appears in the biblical book of Revelation. There followed hail and fire mixed with blood, which fell on the earth, and a third of the earth was burnt up, and a third of the trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Revelation 8, 7. So the book of Revelation actually talks about the stars falling, comets hitting, the sun being blackened, the moon looking like blood, the earth shaking, everything is affected. Is the book of Revelation a prophecy of our future? Was its author divinely inspired to see the cataclysm to come? On the tranquil Greek island of Patmos, the apocalypse could hardly seem more distant. Yet it was here 2,000 years ago that the author of Revelation, known to us only as John of Patmos, became convinced that the end was near. Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of the prophecy and who keeps what is written therein, for the time is near. Revelation 1, 3. The identity of the author remains a perplexing mystery, and yet his words are so powerful in their conviction that millions have believed his ominous prediction. To this day, the question of when this prophet of doom believed the apocalypse would take place is still unanswered. As the first millennium drew to a close, countless Europeans were convinced that the end of the world was at hand. Although obviously the dreaded cataclysm did not occur in the year 1000, Prophets in the centuries that followed continued to issue dire predictions. Perhaps the most influential doomsday prophet of modern times was a New York farmer named William Miller, who derived his predictions from the biblical book of Revelation. His prophecy that the world would end in 1844 sparked hysteria among hundreds of thousands of Americans. 
Even when Miller's prediction proved wrong, his followers continued to believe that the apocalypse was imminent. Did the book of Revelation foretell our own precarious age on the brink of Armageddon? Disasters happen every year somewhere in the world, so it's very easy to look at the San Francisco earthquake and say, oh, that was the earthquake that was foretold in the book of Revelations, therefore the world will end in 1995. But it didn't. Exactly when John, the author of the book of Revelation, expected the apocalypse to occur remains unknown. But in 1555, nearly 1,500 years after John's death, many believe another renowned seer pinpointed the most tumultuous events in world history with astonishing precision. His name, Nostradamus. Nostradamus. Some believe he prophesied the bloody terror of the French Revolution and the rise to power of both Napoleon and Hitler. But is Nostradamus's fame for accurate predictions deserved? Did he truly possess the ability to see into the future? Nostradamus was born in France in 1503. A physician, he earned his reputation treating victims of the dreaded Black Plague, an epidemic which wiped out a third of the population of Europe. And yet Nostradamus gained worldwide renown not from his medical achievements, but from what some assert was an extraordinary ability to see into the future. He recorded more than a thousand prophecies written in cryptic four-line verses called quatrains. Believers in the validity of Nostradamus's predictions insist he accurately foretold the most turbulent events in the history of France. They maintain that he predicted the bloody terror of the French Revolution, which climaxed with the execution of the French royal family. Nostradamus's uncanny perception of future events of the French Revolution doesn't end with the death of Louis XVI. He also gives us details about how his queen, Marie Antoinette, would meet her end. Of all Nostradamus's predictions, the most famous and controversial are those concerning the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte and Adolf Hitler. Some researchers believe Nostradamus foresaw Napoleon's entire career, from his meteoric rise to power to his final defeat at Waterloo in 1815. Applying Nostradamus's prophecies to the 20th century, believers insist he predicted the rise of the Third Reich, the occupation of France, and the Battle of Britain. Some even maintain that Nostradamus identified the evil tyrant Adolf Hitler by name the name thinly veiled in his prophecy as Hister. Beasts ferocious with hunger will swim across the rivers. The greater part of the battlefield will be against Hister. Nostradamus, Century 2, Quatrain 24. Ironically, the Nazis themselves seized on Nostradamus's words as a weapon of war. The wife of Joseph Goebbels, the Nazis' infamous minister of propaganda, first brought Nostradamus to her husband's attention. 
Guruji went, hey, honey, look at this book. Look at all these references to a hister and a captain of greater Germany. Isn't this interesting? Do you think he's talking about our Adolf? Goebbels immediately saw the ancient prophecy's immense propaganda potential. He employed a celebrated astrologer named Karl Kraft to write interpretations of Nostradamus that would be favorable to the Nazis. But as Nazi fortunes flagged, Hitler turned against his soothsayers. In 1941, the Gestapo arrested Kraft as part of a ruthless Nazi roundup of astrologers. Kraft would die a broken man in 1945 in the Nazi death camp known as Buchenwald. Ironically, a victim of the dictator he had helped to glorify. Today, few researchers believe that Nostradamus foresaw the rise of Adolf Hitler. People say, wow, the history, that's just one letter away from Hitler. In fact, if you look at the history, Hister was the name of a river, the Lower Danube, uh, nothing more. A lot of debunkers will say, well, Hister is, is just the old name for the river Danube. That's right, got it right again. But there was also a boy named Adolf Hitler, and most of his demonical ideas for world conquest came in his childhood when he was playing on the banks of the Danube. Whether Nostradamus really foresaw the rise of Adolf Hitler remains a subject of debate. In the 19th century, another psychic would rise to fame, using one of the most ancient forms of divination, interpreting the lines on the palm of the human hand. In the ancient world, such renowned thinkers as Aristotle, Hippocrates, and Plato were said to have practiced an arcane form of prophecy. Palmistry, the art of reading the lines in the palm of the human hand. And yet, perhaps the most talented palmist in history was a now forgotten Englishman from the 19th century known simply as Cairo. Cairo's clients included many of the most celebrated figures of his day, from English playwright Oscar Wilde to American president Grover Cleveland. Even the skeptical Mark Twain went so far as to submit to a hand imprint. But who was Cairo? How did he gain his reputation? And was he really endowed with the ability to see the future? Born in 1866 in County Wicklow, Ireland, Cairo acquired the polish and extravagant tastes of a refined gentleman. Cairo's striking good looks and magnetic personality served him well in his notorious pursuit of Europe's most beguiling socialites. His romantic liaisons were said to include the alluring German spy, Matahari. Some even contended that he engaged in espionage himself. Despite his fabled exploits, Cairo was best known for his reputed ability to foretell the future using palmistry. But how did he utilize this ancient art to make his prophecies? The striking features about your hands are first and foremost the presence of... According to palmistry, there is profound meaning in three aspects of the hand, its size and shape, the characteristics of the fingers, and the lines that crisscross the palm. 
five major lines, head, heart, health, fate, and life course across the palm. Their length, depth, and relation to each other dictate their significance. Employing these ancient principles, Cairo was credited with astonishing prophecies. He warned Tsar Nicholas II, the last monarch of Russia, that he and the entire royal family would meet a violent death. It was a prophecy which the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 turned into a bloody reality. Cairo also predicted that Edward VIII would be forced to abdicate the throne of England for the woman he loved. The king did indeed surrender his crown in 1936 because of his devotion to an American divorcee named Wallace Simpson. In 1911, Cairo cautioned an English newspaper man named W.T. Stead that travel by water would imperil his life, particularly in April of 1912. But Stead ignored Cairo's admonition and booked passage on an ocean liner that sailed April 10, 1912. The name of the ship, the Titanic. Perhaps Cairo's most impressive prediction involved the curse of an ancient pharaoh. In 1922, Lord Carnarvon, a renowned Egyptologist, discovered the fabled tomb of King Tutankhamun. Cairo warned Lord Carnarvon not to enter the newly discovered tomb, lest it cost him his life. Lord Carnarvon ignored the warning. Five months later, he died of a mysterious blood disease. Despite the accuracy of some of Cairo's predictions, scholars dismiss the belief that the lines on our palms contain our fate. We don't know how many other predictions Cairo had made. He probably made in the course of his professional career thousands and thousands of such predictions. Just by chance, some of them are gonna come true. Nevertheless, scientific research has demonstrated surprising evidence of an enhanced connection between the nerves of the hands and the brain. Modern anatomists have shown that the sensory input from the hands is greater than from any other part of the body. Many pediatricians have also found that lines on the palms of infants are valuable predictors of congenital disease. But is the future really imprinted on our hands at birth? Experts argue that forecasting disease is a very different matter from divining the future. I suspect very strongly that as long as there are going to be human beings on the planet, people will believe that dreams or hunches or tea leaves or entrails or crystal balls or the pattern of license numbers on cars on the parkway are going to be a way of foretelling the future. And inevitably, some skeptic will come along and you know, do the study and find that they don't, and people will move on to some other invalid way of predicting the future. Whether the lines on the palm might actually hold the secret to an individual's destiny continues to be debated. And yet some proclaim that the ability to foretell the future is not confined to a handful of extraordinary clairvoyance. Since ancient times, humanity has suffered a terrible series of catastrophes which had only one thing in common. They were totally unexpected.
And yet, with each disaster from ancient times to the space age, the dream has persisted that somehow calamities might be predicted before they struck. Surprisingly, some believe we have always possessed this extraordinary prophetic ability. We have, and I think this is very important, spontaneous cases that occur every day with ordinary folks where they get very convincing glimpses of the future. And this is outside of coincidence and all these other things, very dramatic cases. Most scientists believe, however, that while all of us have frequent premonitions, only an insignificant few actually come true. It's very common to have premonitions of great disasters and little disasters. By chance alone, some of those are just going to come true. We tend to hear about the ones that do come true, and we don't hear about the thousands and thousands and thousands of premonitions that don't come true. In 1897, an obscure American writer named Morgan Robertson was struck by a remarkable premonition. He expressed his vision in a fictional account which bore an uncanny similarity to the true story of the sinking of the Titanic 14 years before it happened. The ship in Robertson's story was astonishingly similar to the Titanic. Both vessels were called unsinkable. Both struck icebergs and took an almost identical number of victims to their watery grave. The name of the ship in Robertson's story? The Titan. Many skeptics, however, remain unimpressed by the similarities. You wouldn't name your great hulking passenger liner the Little Mouse uh, if you wanted a, uh, a dramatic effect. So I, again, I don't think there's anything paranormal here. I think Robertson was making some very good guesses. In addition to Robertson, 18 other people claim to have had premonitions of the Titanic disaster. The interesting thing about the Titanic itself is that, not that it's the most incredible prediction, but it's one of the most recorded predictions. This great unsinkable ship was widely publicized worldwide in the press, and many people thought it was a sign of arrogance, man claiming to have overcome the natural forces in nature. And it roused some resentment, so it's more likely that there would have been more premonitions of something going wrong, maybe almost in a perverse sort of way, wishful thinking. Perhaps no disaster in modern times raises the issue of premonition more intriguingly than the catastrophe which struck a tight-knit Welsh mining community in 1966. The village of Aberfan was nestled in the shadow of a 600-foot mountain of coal slag from nearby mines. On a chilly October morning, loosened by two days of rain, an avalanche of coal waste thundered down towards the village. Thousands of tons of slag crushed trees, swept away scores of homes, and buried the town's school in debris. Some of the helpers tore at the rubble with bare hands in their desperate efforts to get at the children. One teacher said she heard a big rumbling sound and shouted to the children to get under their desks. Another teacher said he heard a tremendous roar. After that, he doesn't remember anything. 144 people were killed, most of them young school children. In the aftermath, over 60 people across Great Britain reported having had premonitions of the disaster. Perhaps the most poignant came from 10-year-old Ariel May Jones, who lived in the doomed village of Aberfan. The day before the disaster, she said to her mother, Mommy, let me tell you about my dream last night. Mother answered gently, Darling, I have no time now. Tell me again later. And she replied, No, Mommy, you must listen. 
I dreamt I went to school and there was no school there. Something black had come down over it. The next morning, Ariel Mae Jones perished along with her classmates under the very avalanche she had foretold. But are such dreams proof of the existence of precognition? Skeptics point out that with perhaps a trillion dreams dreamt around the world each night, it is no wonder that a few seem to foretell the future. Out of a trillion possibilities, some of those are going to come impressively true simply by chance, and one will selectively remember the dreams that come true and forget those that don't come true. Others, however, feel that proven cases of precognition are far too common to be dismissed as mere coincidences. When you have them happening to so many thousands of people all over the world, it's no longer unusual. It's normal, in fact, for people to have these experiences. What's unusual, unfortunately, is for people to pay attention and to actually try to stop or change what they predicted if it's a bad thing or try to make it happen if it's a good thing. Even if premonitions do occur, a deeper mystery remains. Is the future changeable or is it fixed? Are our lives determined by human free will or by destiny? These profound questions sharply divide researchers and challenge our understanding of time itself. For me to believe that individuals or many of us can foretell the future would require that I believe that the future is preordained and I simply can't believe that. We don't know a whole lot about time. Physicists at many levels believe that time might go both ways, that you might be able to pick up information from a future that's probable or definite depending on, how, on what you believe. After centuries of controversy about precognition, at last experts are attempting to replace speculation with scientific research. But even the researchers themselves acknowledge that science has a long way to go before the existence of precognition can be conclusively proven. The elusive dream of seeing into the future continues to tantalize us. To even imagine the prospect opens unlimited possibilities. None of us want to be on the next Titanic or the next 747 to crash or at the scene of the next earthquake. And if we believe that there's a way of foretelling the future, we at least have the illusion that we can, provi we can prevent that kind of thing and save ourselves and our loved ones. And that's a very powerful motive. Is prophecy a secret which the ancients had the key to unlock? Perhaps, in the future, it is conceivable that advancing technology will find a way to shatter the barriers of time. Even Albert Einstein felt that the clear line from the past to the future is an illusion, that the future could very well be buried in the past. It could be an unexpected benefit of our travels in search of history.